Welcome to the Mike and Allison After Hours Podcast with your host, Mike Sheila and Allison Haas, talking business with real business owners in the Mid-Atlantic region. Today's episode is sponsored by Advantage Industries. When you need business technology, get Advantage Industries to protect and promote your business. To learn more, go to www.getadvantage.com and schedule your first meeting to see if you qualify for a free network scan. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Mike and Allison After Hours. I am your host, Mike Sheila, and with me is my always awesome and always on point co-host, Allison Haas. Allison, it is wonderful to see your face today. How the heck are you? You too, sir. I am just fine. It is January 14th. Two weeks into 2021, we made it so far. (laughs) So far, so good. And to quote the mighty Dave Mustaine, so what? All right. (laughs) For those of you that heard our last show, you know that we have a nice little incentive going right now. Mm -hmm. Allison and I have worked very hard to get this show everywhere. So if you're watching us on YouTube, thank you. Uh, Please subscribe to the channel. Give it a like. Drop a comment. And if you are listening to the show, yeah, we are literally everywhere. We are on iHeartRadio. We are on Stitcher. We are on Podbean. We are on Audible. We are on Pandora. We are on iTunes. The list goes on and on and on. So whatever your platform of choice is, please drop a comment, drop a like, write a review, share us on social media, whether that's LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, whatever your platform or platforms of choice are, because in just a couple of weeks, one lucky winner is going to get a signed copy of Allison's book, The Aisle 7. They will, she will mail it right to you. She will sign it. She will I write sure a funny will. little blurb in there that goes <laughs> along with all of it. So we, we are so grateful for everyone that tunes in on a regular basis and listens to the show. And the viewership and the audience is growing week after week. So we are exceptionally grateful for that. And we wanted to do something just to, to give back to kick off the new year. Yeah, sales is rise and fall. Business is ups and downs. It is being at the top of the roller coaster and feeling on top of the world, and it is being on the bottom of the roller coaster and feeling like your guts dropped out. And it's hard. It's a challenge to mitigate those emotions. You know, being a salesperson is not for the meek of heart, and there are a lot of components that go into that. And I know that you, you and I were talking offline that you're, you're really, really close to an incentive. And there's there's not a whole heck of a lot you can do about it other than let the process go, right? Yeah, yeah, so close. And like I told you, it's a beautiful problem to have to be at the top, you know, 15% earners of like my company um, with, with fairly new tenure, right? I'm three years in, and this would be my second year in, in the row reaching this. And it's very humbling. Um, But as a salesperson, I also crave that recognition, right? So I'm like, come on, I just want everybody to know I I whooped it again in a year that really whooped me. And, but it's exactly what you said. I have no control. Like I have two days and I I don't sell a product I can drive to your home and drop off at your doorstep that I can knock 50% off, you know, which and (laughs) not, not knocking anyone that has those products to sell, but you know, mine. It is different. It's a process. It's a it's a business. It, it, it's a business transition and overtaking, and you have to understand it and uh, value it. And that doesn't happen with a drop at your doorstep. So, needless to say, I'm feeling the highs and the lows. And um, yeah, what you said, we have to be emotionally resilient, right? We hear no way more than we hear yes. Um, but I tell you, when I hear one yes, or just have a, a really engaging conversation with someone that gets it and cares about their organization and values its worth as something that helps others, I'm re-energized immediately to then continue doing what I'm doing. So I must just be a glutton for punishment and we must just (laughs) like to be sucker punched all the time with, with the unknowns, right? Yeah. The, the great Darren Hardy in one of his first books talks about the emotional roller coaster And one of the big takeaways I had from reading that book from him was if something bothers you, how long does it bother you? Mm. You know, if it bothers you for a few minutes, that's not a big deal. If it bothers you for an hour, that's not really a big deal either. If it's bothering you for a day, 
you know, you start, you need to start looking at why is it still bothering you? And then, you know, for many of us, there are things that bother us for months, years, you know, and that, that is part of human nature. And that makes it very difficult to remain balanced and keep your perspective when it comes to owning and running a business. And in many ways, sales is similar to running a business. Because as a business owner, you don't know what's going to happen next. You you can control certain things, but so much of it is out of your control. And to just let go of those things that you can't control can be really devastating. It can really, it can really mess with your head. Um, yeah. I was fortunate enough, totally out of the blue, and this this is – Everybody listening to this show has had this experience. I started working on an account in October of 2019. Had my first meeting with the CFO of the company. We met for coffee in Annapolis, you know, back when you still could do things like that. (laughs) And at that time, nothing really came out of it. I had followed up with him once or twice Said, hey, you know, we should schedule a second meeting. Nothing came of it. And then we had we did a marketing campaign around the new cybersecurity compliance for the DOD CMMC. And I got an email back from him on that. And he says, I want you to talk to one of our engineers. Had multiple meetings with the engineers and talked about what we do. And in an oversimplification, we have two products. We have managed services and we have compliance. And each one has their own little variations. But ultimately, those are the two main core products that we provide to businesses. And we came to the agreement that they wanted to do both, but they wanted to do them in a phased approach and they wanted to do them, uh, frankly, backwards. <laughs> mm. <laughs> they, they wanted to do the compliance piece first and then they wanted to start the managed services piece, which is, uh, there are a lot of reasons not to do that, uh, but they actually had a good reason to do it that way. So we got the compliance agreement lined up uh, late August or early September, I'm forgetting now, I wanna say it was early September. So they signed that contract, we got to work on that. And we just got the managed services piece this week. Great. Uh, which I'm yeah, very happy about. Great way to start off the new year. But Absolutely. you just communication is paramount to getting a new client to sign on. And if I look back at this, you know, every sale, win or lose, is a, is an opportunity to evaluate your performance and the one thing I would say is we missed some key points on communication. You know, one of the first breakdowns was when we presented the pricing to our main point of contact, he understood what we were saying. Mm. When that got translated to leadership, mm. something got lost. Yeah. And there are times when you have to let your advocate in the deal speak on your behalf. And the more you can minimize that, the better off you generally are. Yeah. Because again, an engineer is not a trained salesperson, right? They they'll hear a bad answer and they won't necessarily know how to respond to it. I have a much higher likelihood of knowing how to respond to questions that are unclear or vague. Yeah. So you know, that was a real role. So happy that we have it. Very grateful that that came about. But if I look back on it, we probably could have wrapped things up two or three months sooner if I had done a few things more properly on the front end of the sale. And I'm, I'm sure that you have experiences like that too. I do. I'm thinking a few things. One is, is the long game, right? And having, having the perspective that, okay, you need stuff to happen quickly. You need, you need people to say yes more readily, but there are people that certainly are worth pursuing long-term. And if this is something you continue to do and intend to continue to do, like I am, this is my home here um, at my organization, plant those seeds and, and keep fertilizing them. You know, I've, I've had deals close a year, year and a half after our first conversation. And I've had three conversations over three years with some of the same people and it still hasn't, but I'm presenting the same face and a little more experience and a little more education. And I, I really believe that playing the long game is really important. And I think too, our process is similar in that my, my most people would send me to HR 
but HR doesn't understand the financials and the strategic vision and initiative of the entire organization. They understand the nuts and bolts and the day to day, but I, I need the big picture initiative to tie into the day to day nuts and bolts. And so HR cannot sell this for me, right? They can be a, they can stop it from happening, but that's why I need my leadership executive team in the mix too early. So everyone understands because it's not something, like I said earlier, to drop off at the door and it's like, oh, no brainer. I get what that is. Someone comes in and tries to, to share what we do and it's like, I don't know. I don't understand. And so I really, I really appreciate that. Um, and, and having buy-in early from the right people that understand, right? That's the big piece. Understanding what you're, you're offering is huge. I, I think the other side of that coin, and I completely agree with you, is you want to disqualify an opportunity as early as yes. possible so that yes. you don't waste time on it. I, yeah, you don't I want am, to clog your pipeline with people that aren't really interested. Yeah, I am... If, if I have a particular skill that sets me apart from what I've seen is I'm pretty good at gauging the level of interest from a prospective client. And I will adjust that as we go through the process. Mm. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm working on a deal right now and we, we just brought on a new operations person and we were discussing the proposal and how we were going to gauge it. And he was listening to what my engineer Russell and I were talking about regarding this account. And he says to me, you know, well, why wouldn't we do this? Why would we do that? And I said, well, if you'd been in on the first meeting, you would get that there, Russell and I got some red flags mm -hmm. about things that maybe we should and should not do with this account. And that can be critical to how the rest of the session goes. And so the way that I feel about this particular opportunity is we can win. By no means are we a slam dunk. Mm. And should we win, this client will be fairly demanding. Probably more demanding than we're typically comfortable with. Yep. But we think that we've set the pricing in such a way that makes the opportunity worth it. And if they say no, or they try to nickel and dime us, and we're we're con we're content with walking away. Yep. And and that's that's hard, uh, particularly for young salespeople or for a business owner who is yep. inexperienced in sales to grasp. You know, having a great conversation with someone is just that. It's a great conversation. Yep. In the sales world, they talk about having buying signs. Yep. And there are there are certain sales terminologies that have been beaten into the ground and buying signs is one of them. But it, it, it's more about I, I've said this many times before. You go to your local bookstore, your local library, you will find over 100 different books written on how to close a sale, right? Yep. But you very rarely find a book written about how to open a sale. Ah, yep, yeah. And that is, that's the key. I, I, I think I told you the, the, the cake story. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you don't have the right ingredients, your cake's going to taste like crap. And that's, that's what a sale is. Yes. You got to have the right ingredients up front. Uh, so yes. how do you bake your cake, Allison? <laughs> Great. You know, you're I'm so I also shared with you, I'm so close to my incentive and the, and I would have made it already had I not lost a deal that had signed already earlier in this year. And had I had more faith that the year was going to turn out well, I would have aborted that deal well before we ever got halfway into it because I saw red flags from the first call that we had. Yeah. And but, right, I'm hungry and I'm tenacious and I'm like, maybe it'll be different. But intuitively, you have enough conversations with enough people you know. And while I still see it through, everyone deserves respect. And again, I really genuinely want to be a resource and an education point at the worst. 
So even if, if at the end of the day we shake hands and say, hey, this isn't a match, I, I still want to see it through, even though sometimes you, you know, I know you've had calls, you get started, you're like, um, my grandmother just called, she's in the hospital, I got to go, right? Um, you know, so, so I didn't do that. But, you know, this, this deal took, I think, four months, five months, and then um, was painful every, every step of the way. And Eventually, they backed out after they signed. And honest to God, I think I slept the best I had slept that night in many months because there was a relief now because I knew what I was bringing in to the organization and what the kind of service was going to be like. And it was not good. They didn't appreciate what we had. There was no value. It was just a nickel and dime process. And so how I bake my cake, you know, it's it's in the first conversations, do you value the people that work for you? Or are they just a number? Are they just slumming their through their work and costing you health care? Um, or do you really value them as individuals with family members that are going to make or break your business? People are your greatest asset, right? And how you treat them really adds up. Um, you know, do you value my time? You know, are you on time? Do you show me your face on Zoom? Right. That's a huge thing for me now. I certainly respect people when they can't be on camera, but I also know this is the world we're in now. Virtual settings. You know, yep. I, I how are you presenting yourself when you are on camera? What's your body language? What's your posture? What are you wearing? And I know this sounds really granular, but I have to say, as a professional, it really does matter. And it speaks volumes about what you think of yourself and my time and organization, right? And are you engaged? Are you looking at me? Are you on your cell phone? We can tell, right? Um, I And I try and tell people, hey, I'm taking notes. So I'm looking down, that's what's happening. Or I'm taking notes on my second monitor. I'm listening, but my eyes are averted. And I try and communicate what's happening because you know, someone's level of respect for me ultimately will either make or break the deal and either help it transition forward or not. Um, did I answer your question? Yeah. In, in fact, <laughs> you, you gave me two great things to, to bring up here. You brought it back to a subject that you and I talk a lot about, which is emotional intelligence. And I, I think one of the best examples of what you just went through is in a book by Malcolm Gladwell called Blink, mm. where we have this, this fight or flight, this, this safe or not safe at our very core of our being. And the book Blink talks about how miraculously we make accurate snap judgments after looking at something in the blink of an eye. Mm. It's amazing. It's, it's an evolutionary mm. piece of being a human being that we all have. Now, the downside to that is there's a substantial bit of that that still thinks that we are cave dwellers in the pre-dinosaur era like that <laughs> so there, there's a part of us that just reacts that way and i forget which emotional intelligence book it was that i read but it talks about the difference between the gut and the heart mm -hmm. and when people say i'm going to trust my gut on this one that's actually your 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 lizard brain taking everything that's happened to you in life and saying all right i've seen x amount of situations like this before this was the outcome so i know what to do that's the gut so when you trust your gut the overwhelming majority of the time you're going to make the right decision now the challenge with that is we also like to listen to our heart and what our heart is doing is going yes i see this evidence i see this statistically we have a 77 percent chance of failure with this but I've got a 33% chance that I might do it. So I'm gonna. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes for me, Mike, it's clearing away the debris so I can get very clear about which is which, right? Yeah. Because sometimes intuitively we know and we don't like the answer that's coming up and it's uncomfortable and it may go against general popularity, right? It may go against what somebody thinks is the right thing in the moment. Um, so it's clearing out the debris so that we are clear. And that'll take us back to what we were saying initially with the roller coaster. You know, if I'm at the in the bottom of, of the ride 
I may make different decisions than if I'm feeling good and confident and 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 those cool. decision processes aren't necessarily good or bad. They're different. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And I and, and in being a salesperson with this with this required resilience, um, I think being able to slow it all down long enough and for me act my way into to better thinking and feeling you know instead of pouting and when someone said no and beating them up for them to say yes it's like what can i do what's within my control here what actions can i take to set myself up for success for tomorrow you know and i continue to do those things plant my seeds and act my way doing what i can to control the situation to set me up for success and then if I did the best I could on every single day, I'm good. But if I didn't, and I can honestly answer that, and I let my emotions take over and get the best of me, um, that's a different that's a different animal all in of itself. Yeah, and for our audience, uh, I shortly realized after saying it that 73% plus 33% is 106%. Uh, please forgive me. I was an English major in college. Math is not my strong suit. It's all good. <laughs> So that, that, that being said, the other thing that you keyed in on, which is an extension of emotional intelligence, and I don't think I've had this conversation with you yet, but body language. Mm. Sometime when I went down the rabbit hole with reading all the emotional intelligence mm. books, I found several great body language books, uh, one written by a former FBI agent talking about how he evaluated criminals. And he... Wow. he <clears throat> a couple of very enlightening things came out of that. He said that, you know, regardless of how much training you have, uh, it's still easy to misread a situation. I, I think he put it at, you can be like 55% accurate, which is slightly better than a coin toss with extensive training. But that wow. just goes to show you how poorly we can be in general without yeah. intentional practice right. around that. And the other thing that he pointed out that was very interesting to me is that people that have been in abusive relationships are much better at reading nonverbal social cues than mm. the average person because they have to be able to notice that hand clenching into a fist. Yes. They have to be able to notice that small twitch at yeah. the left corner of the lip that's going to turn into a snarl, which is going to turn into yelling. They get very good at picking up these cues. And with that, we often don't recognize that we're doing it. Mm. Uh, I, I've had numerous people tell me over the years, you know, Mike, you're, you're so gosh darn happy. Why are you happy all the time? And I said, well, when I was around 18 or 19 years old, I remember several people and telling me, What's bothering you? I'm like, mm. I mean, nothing's bothering you. They go, you look like you're mad. Mm. So what I learned was my resting face was quite menacing. Yeah. And now I'm not a huge guy. I'm six foot tall. I weigh 260 pounds. So by some comparisons, I'm a little overbearing. And you put a menacing face on a, a frame like that. And your average person walking down the street probably does get intimidated. Sure. So I typically, I'm like, hey, how you doing? Great to see you. I, I tend to over project that because I would rather overwhelm people with happiness than scare the hell out of them. And, you know, that's a great point for a business owner. What you say certainly matters, but how you say it. Yep. The language yes. that you use to convey it yes. also matters. And equally important, when you realize you said or did something wrong, the sooner you can own up to it and say, I'm sorry. Yeah. It makes all the difference in the world. Yep. I learned that about my face with the car lot and my non-smile face is another human's compared to my smiling face. And I don't realize it because I'm very pensive. I'm thinking all the time. 
So typically I'm not smiling while I'm doing that. And so I'm walking around looking like I might kill you. And it's all because I'm just thinking in, and I'm so intense about it. And people are like, are you all right? Lighten up, right? And so my old manager taught me like, <laughs> When you smile, it, you're, it's a game changer and you immediately diffuse and disarm people. So I learned selling cars, like smile, right? Even if it hurts to smile and greet people with a smile and it softens the mood and in, invites people to come in, right? And even my boss comments when we do our Zoom meetings, I always sit up, you know, I'm not slouching and looking bored. Um, I'm, I try not to do this. Right. Um, I, I just I stay open and relaxed and I'm I'm inviting conversation here. I'm listening. I'm attentive. I'm sitting up. I'm poised. Um, but yeah, that I do have a funny story about how to make you smile, which may or may not be appropriate for the car lot. But I'm going to share it anyway just for our <laughs> entertainment factor. So I also learned we had pockets. We wore khakis. And if <laughs> if you put your middle fingers in your pockets while you're talking to a, someone that's just beating you up, they don't know, but it makes you smile. So the whole time <laughs> somebody is trying to grind you to a pulp, you're sitting there with your middle that's fingers funny. out in your pockets, smiling away, and they have no idea. So there's a, a there's a treat for you. If you're talking to someone that's killing you, just do that. They won't see it. It'll make you smile. And I mean, I'm smiling. I'm not even doing it, right? Yeah, yeah. So, and so I, I, I love that. Because there are moments that we have to key in on feeling different than the moment is making us feel. Yes. Yeah. Uh, again, my very first sales job selling insurance door to door mm. uh, was a miserable job, but it gave me some great sales fundamentals. One of the first things they taught us was smile and use humor. Mm. Yeah. Because if you can make people laugh, yep. it's much easier to engender them to you yes and your your thought about smiling even if you don't feel like smiling that's something you don't want to just do it's something you want to work on yeah because again one of these many body language books i read there are a ridiculous number of muscles that go into making you smile mm -hmm. now we can trigger it i can do that without really trying but the key is the moment I did that, you recognize that, oh, Mike's not really smiling because he's happy. He's smiling right. and should smile. Right. And there are a dozen, a dozen or more muscles around your your orbital bone that go into a genuine smile. Mm -hmm. And the gentleman that studied this, I'll I'll look the book up and I'll put it in the show notes. He numbered all the muscles and he worked. Like you go to the gym to, you know, you want to build your arms, you want to build your legs, you want to build your abs. He, he developed his facial muscles wow, so that he could mimic, I, I think he came up with like 30 or 40 different general expressions wow. and he could do it on demand. Wow. Now that's literally what this guy did for a living. If any of you remember the show lie to me with Tim Roth a few years ago on Fox, that show was based on this man. Absolutely wow. brilliant. You know, he went to he went to an Aboriginal jungle, lived among tribes people to understand what is universal about facial expressions and what is not. So it's it's fascinating stuff. And the more that you can understand how to mirror what the other person in front of you is doing, how to smile when you're supposed to be smiling, uh, the better off you are. You, uh, uh, people that are in the entertainment industry, actors, actresses. They oh, yeah. the really good ones are really good because they can do that stuff very authentically. Yes. Yes. Believe they're able to shift into a role yep. and understand that role, whether we hate that person or love that person in the role. Yep. That's what makes it great acting. Yep. Yep. So business owners, uh, not only do you have to be a business owner, not only do you have to be a salesperson, not only do you have to understand finances, not only do you have to understand operations, uh, but take some acting classes because that'll help. <laughs> you have to be happy at all times. Yeah, no well, matter what. that's a great point. Emotional Intelligence 2.0, one of the things they talk about is being angry at the right time for the right reasons. 
and I know you and I are both guilty of this, that we've had moments in our life where something has fronted us and we have not shared our true feelings. Now, there's a right way and a wrong way to share true feelings, sure, sure. depending on the situation, but we all do that, right? Yeah. And and that can be exceptionally overwhelming. Um, yeah. And it, it makes it harder for people to engage with us. Yeah, yeah. So, Allison, what are you looking forward to in 2021? What's what's on the horizon for you professionally? Oh, goodness gracious. Um, so despite having a less than stellar year, even though I'm very close to where I, I gotcha. want to be on one end, there is there it's because of spillover from incentives from last year. So I'm not saying I didn't do a good job this year. It just wasn't the job that I set out to do pre knowing the world was going to upend itself. So um, this year, I really want to, there are so many stages to my craft, right? There's, well, and any sales craft, it's the discovery prospecting phase and learning how to per, per, protect and protect, perfect that process, right? How do you get really good at finding the right people to talk to, securing the meetings, educating on what you do. And then there's the proposal building stage, which for me is a lot of math and a huge undertaking behind the scenes because I'm looking at taxes and payroll and workers' comp and healthcare benefits and all the things they're already utilizing from an HR perspective. Then it's the presentation phase. Then it's the closing phase. So I want to get better in the latter stages. Um, but I do. I have some lofty goals. I I don't necessarily think I need to share numbers, but um, it's funny because because today at 12 o'clock, my boss and I have my one-on-one -on -one for my 2021 business plan review. And Fantastic. For me, one, that's really important to write stuff down in a chartable manner, right? And it may, some of these goals might be really outlandish, but to drill down and get granular as to how that's going to happen. Um, you know, what, what conversion ratio do you need to have for meeting to proposal to sale? Um, to hit your goals instead of just mass volume, throw it all at the wall, hope something sticks, right? Have an actual plan that you've charted out strategically. Um, so I really want to focus on slowing down my process to higher quality. I'm great at mass volume um, and quantity, but I want to be better quality. And I, I mean, I just just continue to to be open to learning, right? We're we're doing debrief and post calls um, with my boss after we do meetings because I do most by myself. Great. Love it. But I, That's I a bingo don't know moment. what I'm doing. It. Yeah, I don't. But I don't I don't know everything. And she has she's been doing it for eight, nine years. I've been doing it for three. So she has experience on her side and she thinks of questions to ask that just aren't on my radar. Right. When we're in a conversation, we can't see everything. Um, so having outside perspective uh, to, to do that and be more strategic about what I ask and why. Um, but, but, you know, professionally, Mike, I really just want to keep going, you know, like I don't need to undo everything I did. I, I just need to keep going. Um, I think for most of us in sales this year, just, it was a, it was a coin toss as to whether or not it was good or bad luck, bad or great timing, right? Um, most organizations I talk to are doing well, but it's still an uncertain time. So I had a lot of not yet. So this year is going to be a lot of circling back to those not yet, as well as capitalizing on new opportunities. Um, I'm a resource for other peers now. So I, I really want to. You're the grizzled veteran. <laughs> yes. Somehow I made it already. But I, you know, I want to do them justice. Right. And, and just slow down my whole life. I just want to slow everything down, be a little bit softer and methodical. Um, you know, I'm closer to 36 now than I, I am 35 years old will be, right? But it's given me some some experience and wisdom, right? Like going really fast all the time, you miss a whole lot, right? So that is that is my, my key. I have financial goals. I have number goals, which are important. Um, and I had them last year, and I, I was just shy of some of them. But I think that's good. I used to think that if I didn't hit the goal, I failed. But I think you should have goals that you can't hit because it's constantly encouraging you to get better. Yeah. What about you? And attainable. Yeah. Yeah. We, at my, at my company, I've mentioned this before, we use the EOS model that is featured in the book traction 
to run our operations and improve efficiencies. And one of the big things from that is, you know, having your rocks. So the company should have a rock. Individuals should have rocks that lead towards the company rock. And in my particular case, my rock for this quarter, first quarter of 2021, is to schedule 21 new discovery meetings. And that's that's an aggressive number. Mm. But per month? No, for the quarter. Quarter, got it. So, and we could have an entire sideshow about what makes a discovery meeting. Because when they first hired me and they told me that, I'm like, oh, that's nothing. I could do that. Oh, no yeah. problem. But, no, it's not. <laughs> Right. To, to be labeled a discovery meeting in our process, there's a series of criteria, and there could be one or two or three qualifying meetings before you actually have a discovery meeting. That, that's it. a short oversimplification of it. But it, it's a lofty goal. But And I was talking to our operations manager about it, and I said, yeah, what I anticipate is January is probably going to suck. Uh, I'm not going to do – if you break that down into – metrics of three seven a month yeah i probably won't have seven by the end of january but i'm guessing that i'll have seven or more in the month of february and mm. then i'll have a really big march so it'll have that it'll have that hockey stick effect yeah. so that by the time i get to march if i'm not at that 21 number i'll be really close yep and yep. that will have generated some really good business for the company and then you know with that we also talked about what revenue should look like. And that's something that, you know, I have discussed with our owner for a long time saying, look, this it's very unusual that we don't base things on revenue, that we're basing it on these appointments. But mm -hmm. it, that's a, it's a sales model from one of our consultants. And again, it's not wrong, it's different. And it's different from anything I've ever done before. But now we're starting to have conversations around, okay, well, what should revenue from our new clients look like? What are What are our ideal clients? from a size standpoint, from a location standpoint, from an industry standpoint, because all of those things matter to the core success of your business, right? Yes, yes, yeah. Well, folks, I have to say, this has been a very fun episode of Allison and I riffing back and forth. So we wanna <laughs> say thank you very much for listening to Mike and Allison After Hours. And again, remember, if you're watching the show on YouTube, first of all, thank you, but be sure yeah. to give it a like and drop a comment and share it. And if you're on one of our social media podcasts, please write a review, give it a like, give it a share on your social media, because all that one is going to help us, which we're exceptionally grateful for, but equally important, one of you lucky listeners is going to get a copy of Allison's book signed and personalized by her, The Addict Denial 7, available on Amazon. So thank you, Allison Haas. I am Mike Sheila. This is Mike and Allison After Hours. And remember, people helping people, it is powerful stuff. Have a great day. Thank you for joining Mike and Allison After Hours. Tune in next time for another great business owner sharing valuable industry ideas. Want to be a guest on our show? Contact us at answers at getadvantage.com.